Relaxation can help us as well. Relaxation is absolutely essential for tapping into the power within. Because if you are tense and frightened, you shut off your energy. It only takes a few minutes a day to allow the body and the mind to let go and relax. At any moment, you can take a few deep breaths, close your eyes, and release whatever tension you're carrying. As you exhale, become centered and say to yourself silently, I love you, all is well. You will notice how much calmer you feel. You are building messages that say you don't have to go through life tense and frightened all the time. Meditate on a daily basis. I also recommend quieting your mind and listening to your own inner wisdom. Our society has made meditation into something mysterious and difficult to achieve. And yet meditation is one of the oldest and simplest processes there is. All we need to do is get into a relaxed state and repeat silently to ourselves words like love or peace or anything meaningful to us. Om is an ancient sound that I often use at my workshops and it seems to work very well. We could even repeat, I love myself or I forgive myself or I am forgiven and then just listen for a while. Some people think that if they meditate they have to stop their minds from thinking. We really can't stop the mind, but we can slow down our thoughts and then just let them flow through. Some people sit with a pad and pencil and write down their negative thoughts because they seem to dissipate more easily. If we can get to a state where we are watching our thoughts float by, oh, there's a fear thought and some anger. Now there's a love thought and now a disaster. There's an abandonment thought, a joy thought, and don't give these thoughts importance. Then we begin to use our tremendous power wisely. You can begin meditation anywhere and allow it to become a habit. Think of meditation as focusing on your higher power. You become connected with yourself and your inner wisdom. You can do it in whatever form you like. Some people go into a kind of meditation while they're jogging or walking. Again, don't make yourself wrong for doing it differently. I love to get on my knees in the garden and dig in the dirt. It's a great meditation for me. An excellent, easy to understand book on meditation is Minding the Body, Mending the Mind by Joan Borsenko. Visualize optimistic outcomes. Visualization is also very important, and there are many techniques you can use. Dr. Carl Symington, in his book, Getting Well Again, recommends a lot of visualization techniques for people with cancer, and they often yield excellent results. With visualization, you create a clear, positive image that enhances your affirmation. Many of you have written to me about the kinds of visualizations you do along with your affirmations. The important thing to remember about visualizations is that they must be compatible with the kind of person you are, otherwise your visualizations will not work. For instance, a woman with cancer pictured the good killer cells in her body attacking the cancer and killing it. At the end of the visualization, she doubted whether she had done it correctly and didn't feel that it was working for her. So I asked her, are you a killer person? And she answered, I personally don't feel good about creating a war in my body. So I suggested that she change her visualization to one that was a little more gentle. I think it's better to use images like the sun melting the sick cells, or a magician transforming them with his magic wand. When I had my cancer, 
I used the visualization of cool, clear water washing the diseased cells out of my body. We need to do visualizations that are not so offensive to us on the subconscious level. Those of us who have family or friends who are sick do them an injustice by continually seeing them sick. Visualize them well. Send them good vibrations. However, remember that getting well is really up to them. There are many good audio tapes with guided visualizations and meditations that you can give them to help them through this process if they are open. If not, just send them love. Everyone can visualize, describing your home, having a sexual fantasy, imagining what you would do to a person who hurt you, are all visualizations. It's amazing what the mind can do. Number five, the next step is to praise yourself. Criticism breaks down the inner spirit and praise builds it up. Acknowledge your power, your God self. We are all expressions of the infinite intelligence. When you berate yourself, you belittle the power that created you. Begin with the little things. Tell yourself that you are wonderful. If you do it once and then stop, it doesn't work. Keep at it, even if it's one minute at a time. And believe me, it does get easier. The next time you do something new or different, or something you are just learning and you're not too adept at, be there for yourself. It was a big thrill the first time I spoke at the Church of Religious Science in New York. I remember it very well. It was a Friday noon meeting. People wrote questions and put them in a basket for me, the speaker. I brought the basket to the podium and answered the questions and did a small treatment after each one. After I finished, I walked away from the podium and said to myself, Louise, you were fantastic, considering this was the first time out. By the time you do this six times, you're going to be a pro. I didn't berate myself and say, oh, you forgot to say this or that. I didn't want to have the second time be something that would frighten me. If I beat myself up the first time, I would beat myself up the second time and I would dread speaking in the end. And after a couple of hours, I thought of what I could change to improve. I never made myself wrong. I was very careful to praise myself and congratulate myself for being wonderful. And by the time I had conducted six meetings, I was a pro. I think we can apply this method in all areas of our lives. I continued speaking at the meetings for quite some time. It was wonderful training because it taught me how to think on my feet. Allow yourself to accept good whether you think you deserve it or not. I've discussed how believing that we are not deserving is our unwillingness to accept good in our lives. It's what stops us from having what we want. How could we create anything good for ourselves if we think we don't deserve to have good? Think about the laws of deserving in your home. Did you feel good enough, smart enough, tall enough, pretty enough, whatever? And what do you have to live for? You know you are here for a reason. And it's not just to buy a new car every few years. What are you willing to do to fulfill yourself? Are you willing to do affirmations, visualizations, treatments? Are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to meditate? How much mental effort are you willing to exert to change your life and make it the life you want? Number six, loving yourself means supporting yourself. Reach out to friends and allow them to help you. You really are being strong when you ask for help when you need it. So many of you have learned to be so self-reliant and self-sufficient. You can't ask for help because your ego won't let you. Instead of trying to do it all yourself and then getting angry at yourself because you can't make it, Try asking for help next time. 
There are support groups in every city. There are 12-step programs for almost every problem. And in some areas, there are healing circles and church-affiliated organizations. If you can't find what you want, you can start your own group. It's not as scary as you might think. Gather together two or three friends who have the same issues that you have and set up a few guidelines to follow. Have a book to study or tapes to listen to. If you do it with love in your heart, your little group will grow. People will be attracted like a magnet. Don't worry if it starts to grow and your meeting space gets too small. The universe always provides. If you don't know what to do, write my office and we'll send you guidelines on how to conduct a little group. You really can be there for each other. I started the Hayride in Los Angeles in 1985 with six men with AIDS in my living room. We didn't know what we were going to do about this intense crisis. I told them we weren't going to sit around playing Ain't It Awful because we already knew that. We did what we could on a positive level to support each other. We're still meeting today and we have about 200 people coming every Wednesday night to West Hollywood Park. It's an extraordinary group for people with AIDS and everybody is welcome. People come from all over the world to see how this group functions and because they feel supported. It's not only me, it's the group. Everyone contributes to making it effective. We meditate and do visualizations. We network and share information about alternative therapies and the latest medical methods. According to Lewis Hay, people tend to worry about too many things at once and don't give themselves a peace of mind. Lewis Hay has stated that when a person does not relax, all they're doing is putting themselves in more stress, which leads to anxiety and then further on, along with limiting the body's potential for greatness. Based on her teachings, people should find time in their day to relax and let go, be it through meditation or by some other means, because if a person is not relaxed, they can't do what they're fully capable of doing to their full capability. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and do make sure to share your thoughts with us in the comment section below.